Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, you know, I'm going to talk about state uh, and why it's the single biggest source of complexity in software development. Um, it's not directly related to functional programming, like you have state regardless of whether you're programming in a functional style or not. But statelessness and pure algorithms play a key role in many functional concepts. Um, and the use of state can make functional programming very difficult. And this kind of alludes to some of the things that Natasha and Brian have already gone over too. But I'm going to dive a bit deeper and kind of get definitional on everyone. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to note that the whole presentation is actually already available on GitHub. Um, I guess it's technically in a pull request on a branch. But if you want to look at this, there are, there are references and links to every paper and talk and everything. Um, because I'm going to drop a few names, <laughs> uh, not arrogantly. <laughs> um, so like Chris said, I work at GitHub. This isn't playing because Dex said. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I work on GitHub for Mac and GitHub for Windows. Um, I'm also here with a couple other guys from GitHub. Um, but we do a lot of like functional inspired stuff like Reactive Cocoa and various other things. Um, so I'm, I wanted to give this talk um, instead of something more concrete, like a talk about Reactive Cocoa, uh, because I want to impart abstract knowledge. Um, programming is all about abstraction, and an understanding of theory is hugely important for solving practical, real-world problems. You still need theory to do that. And functional programming is a kind of abstraction. We want to be using the best possible abstractions for development. Um, because the best abstraction can reduce complexity, increase reliability, maintainability, and the confidence that you have in your code, that it does what you expect it to do. Um, so I'm going to explain why state is harmful, and then talk about some tools to minimize it, some of which have already been mentioned today. Um, but let's get on the same page about what it actually is. My definition is that state are, is the aggregate or the sum of all your stored values at any given time. Um, it consists of all the values you currently have. Mutation is the act of updating some state in place. So you have a bunch of values which represent the whole execution state of your program. Mutation is the act of changing that whole world. Um, variables are one example. It's pretty straightforward, right? You have a variable, you can assign stuff to it, you can mutate it by adding or giving it a new value, whatever it may be. All of this is changing the variable in place. You can think of it as a box and you change the thing inside the box. And this is easy, right? This is familiar, approachable. This is how we learn to program, so it comes naturally to us. But ease and simplicity are not actually the same thing. And that's really what this talk is going to get into. Um, Rich Hickey does a great presentation about this called Simple Made Easy. Um, something that's easy is familiar or approachable, like I said. That's stuff you're used to, basically. Um, and we all came into programming probably through imperative programming. So we're used to state, and we're used to programming in imperative style. But simplicity is stricter than that. Simplicity is about having as few concepts as possible. It's minimizing the number of different things you need to think about. The biggest problem with state is that it can go bad. Anytime you've restarted your computer or an app or whatever to fix a problem that you've been having, you were a victim of state. Some state went bad, and you had to restart, and suddenly you have a new fresh state, and then things are better, right? For a little while. Um, complexity, the opposite of simplicity, is mixing ideas or concepts together, things you have to think about together. And state falls into this category because it mixes together completely unrelated parts of your application. When the state of one component depends on the state of another, and so on, you've gotten them all coupled and tied together very closely when they don't need to be. And this is what causes things, or this is one reason why things might go bad at some point. So it's familiar but complex. Um, to make an analogy here, like it's definitely easier to put all your model data into dictionaries, like NS Dictionary, than to create purpose-specific model classes. But it's much simpler to create purpose-specific model classes. Everyone understands dictionaries, so it's familiar and so forth. But they make your code more complex and error-prone because you might expect a dictionary in one format, but get something else. You might expect one sort of schema, but get something else. All systems have essential complexity. This is the complexity that's part of the problem you're trying to solve. Connecting to the internet, for example, exposes you to all the complexity inherent in networking. Like there's the TCP IP stack and so on and so forth and dropped packets and blah, 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 you know, time, asynchrony. 
Um, but incidental complexity is stuff that's not, complexity that's not actually necessary, right? It arises because of the choice you make in your architecture or your design choices. Um, and state falls into this category because it's completely avoidable. In fact, state is exponentially complex. And this may not be immediately obvious, but if you think about a set of Booleans, uh, if you only have one Boolean, you have two possible states that your program can be in. Like, it's either visible or it's not visible, right? This is a slide I could from Josh Abernathy originally, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's visible or it's not visible, right? It's two states. The moment you add another Boolean, you suddenly have four states. You have a matrix. It's visible and enabled, visible and disabled, invisible and enabled, invisible and disabled, and so on and so forth. Every new Boolean that you've added is doubling the number of possible states your program can be in. For more complicated data types, the growth is even more dramatic. So state is exponentially complex. It's also just a glorified cache. And what I mean by this is like, if you think about a variable, a variable is kind of like a cache for a single value. You can store something into the cache. You can invalidate it by changing that value. Um, and you operate it on it and so forth. So that makes sense, right? Like, What's the big deal about that? Well, it turns out cache invalidation is really, really hard. This is one of the hardest problems we've ever had to solve as computer scientists. And in a GUI application, user interaction means having to recalculate or invalidate a whole bunch of different states. Like the user taps a button, you need to do something in reaction to that button, and suddenly you're invalidating all this other stuff that you thought you knew. Andy Matishak has a good example of this. Um, he refers to table, well, sorry, he, he describes mutability and aliasing as kind of the same thing. Um, and I have an example of a table view here, right? Like if you think about UI table view, um, it has its own kind of internal list of rows and sections and so forth. And when the user clicks a button, we want to add a row to the end of the table view. But the problem is we also have this other source of data, this alias or this cache, which is the, the model data that we want to be presenting, right? And so we need to make sure that these two different sources of data stay connected, stay consistent with each other. Um, so it's like when we add a row to the table view, we need to make sure that our model objects or our list of model objects also gets an addition. If, for example, we removed the append or we did something different than insertion, we would have a crash at runtime. And there's basically no way to predict this except by making sure you don't make that mistake. Um, so this code is easy to verify as correct, right? But in real application code, it can be hard to follow all the different ways in which the table view is being modified and the data source is separately being modified. And I'm sure you know anyone that's been writing iOS apps for a significant amount of time, you've had a UI table view or UI collection view crash from an inconsistent data source. That's because it's a cache for information that you already have elsewhere. State is also unpredictable, which makes code very difficult to reason about. Um, and when code is hard to reason about, bugs crop up. Um, every developer has a different understanding of what the code means or what it's supposed to be doing. And I'll, I'll sh go on in more detail about why it's unpredictable in a bit. Um, Race conditions are, are one form of unpredictability. Um, this is you know, when two threads try to use the same state at the same time, and let's say they're both making a modification. You can see inconsistency in the best case, or you can see corruption or crashes in the worst case. Um, and I use race conditions as an example because it's exceptionally hard to prove that they don't exist. Right? You can focus on eliminating them through careful code analysis. Um, you can try just making sure that you understand the flow of logic and, and all the possible orderings that can happen at runtime. Um, but that's time consuming and it's error prone. And you can't, it's very, very hard to actually prove this code is free of races. And race conditions are, of course, a consequence of state. This is an Albert Einstein quote. Um, so here's another example of unpredictability, a more simple one. Reading a property at two different points in time can result in two different values. Now, we're used to this because we've been doing this for forever, but isn't that crazy that you can read something, it's the same thing you're reading, but it has two different values at two different points in time? It's unpredictable. It's also hard to test. Brian alluded to this a lot in his presentation, right? But it's like, if you have state that you need to be setting up, you need to make sure that it does exactly what you want it to do and that it actually replicates the real world scenario and that you've covered, covered all these possible cases that could possibly occur in the real world. Tests, after all, verify that certain outputs are 
the expected outputs are what you get when you give certain inputs. Um, but state is an implicit input. And method calls can also change state during a test, which can introduce issues with ordering and repeatability. Like if you've ever tested anything asynchronous, this might have come up. This is just a pretty amazing GIF, I don't know. <laughs> so I do want to like pause here real quick, though, because most Cocoa applications do require some state. Like it's part, it's embedded in the frameworks that we develop with, and that's okay. Like there are things like these examples that you're gonna have to be stateful about. Like NS user defaults is stateful. It's a cache that you mutate in place. Um, these are part of, let's say, the essential complexity of developing a Cocoa application. Um, but there are many things outside of this that are not and that we can avoid. So although it's not possible to eliminate all of it, we can try to minimize it and therefore minimize incidental complexity as much as possible. And here are the three techniques that I'm going to discuss. Um, excuse me, the first two were discussed by Natasha in her talk, um, value types and purity, or, or what's known as mathematical functions. Um, all of these are used extensively in functional programming to help with this problem. A value, if you're not familiar, is just a piece of data, like a string, a number, a collection, a date. Um, values don't change. So converting mutable objects into immutable values is a great way to eliminate state. These are Swiss value types, as you probably know by now. Um, excuse me, let me be correct. These are Swift's types with which you can create values. Um, classes, by contrast, are always reference types. And the advantage of, one advantage of a value type is that it's always copied, it's not shared. Um, so like a reference type, you know, the reference is passed around and you're always referring to the same thing, and if that same thing changes in place, suddenly it's affecting all the users of it. Um, but modifying a struct, for example, doesn't modify pre-existing copies that you had of that struct. And we'll see why this is important. Values never change, only variables do. And we'll go into this. Um, this is kind of what I imagine you to be thinking right now. <laughs> values are immutable in Swift if, if you actually have created a real value type, but it might be hard to see why. Um, so here's a simple struct that I've defined for representing a geometric point. We'll pretend we don't have CG point because. Um, it has some writable properties. You can see the X and Y, like those can be set, right? Um, and it has a mutating function that scales the point by a factor. Um, so if we use the var keyword, we can of course create a point and it's, it appears that we can write straight to it, right? Um, we can call our mutating method and it appears that the point has changed in place. But what does it actually mean for it to have changed in place? It's kind of at the heart of what I want to get at. So let's change this slightly, and let's use a constant, a read-only variable, before continuing. So we have Q now, which it can't be written to. You know, as we'd expect, Q retains the original value while P has been scaled, if we call the scale function. Um, and there's nothing particularly remarkable about this so far, right? Like I haven't proved that value types are immutable in Swift. In fact, it seems to contradict that entirely. But let me return to what I said before. Variables mutate, values never change. So what's actually been happening in these examples is that the variable is being updated to point at a new value. And we've, when we've been scaling the point or changing its coordinates, what we're doing is we're actually creating a new point which we store into the variable. So looking at the code again, the only difference between P and Q is the kind of variable declaration that we used, right? We've declared that the variable Q may never change. And what this actually means is that the value stored in P, the value stored in the variable P, is allowed to be replaced, while the value stored in Q is not. And any attempts to update the value in Q will fail. And so we have point structures, but the point structures aren't changing. The variables are changing which point structure they have stored in themselves, if that makes sense. To really drive this point home, I want to look at how mutating functions are implemented real quick, because I think it's illustrative. We'll contrast our mutable scale function, uh, excuse me, mutating scale function with a non-mutating one you see at the top, kind of in the string by concatenating string or whatever style. Um, so our, you know, the first realization between these two examples is that if we're thinking about these as instance methods, there's a hidden parameter of self, right? 
The compiler inserts this automatically. You don't see it, but this is kind of what it looks like under the hood. Um, except there's a little wrinkle here. Swift's arguments are read only by default. So the mutating method here wouldn't actually be valid. You can't write to a read only self. Instead, it really takes in out self. And this is kind of the key to this whole mutability model, and this is precisely why value types in Swift are so powerful. Because what this function is doing is it's accepting a copy of a point, transforming it, and then storing it back to the caller. But storage is a concept that's associated with variables and not values. What you're doing is you're writing to the variable at the call site, and this method is only mutating because of that. If the variable is read only, it can't be passed into an in out parameter, so a mutating method can't be used. So variables mutate, values never change. Values won't mutate from underneath you, and you can use let to declare variables that don't either. Okay, so that was kind of long-winded. Why does it matter? Who cares? Values are automatically thread safe. They're immutable by definition, according to the examples I just gave. Um, there's no problem, there's no race condition if multiple threads are using the same value. This is unlike variables, which would have to be synchronized in the same situation, right? So if two threads have P and Q, let's say, the point pulled out of either of those doesn't have to be synchronized. But if you want to mutate the variable P, you have to make sure you synchronize that action with other threads. Values, unlike state, which is often non-deterministic, values are always predictable automatically. You can use them repeatedly and always see the same results. So in this example, if we pull out a value from some structure or object or whatever it is, but we assume that's a value type, and then any properties that we read on it will always be the same because values are immutable. Um, so it, it helps with predictability and reproducibility and so forth. In addition to value types, pure or mathematical algorithms are another great way to eliminate state. Um, as mentioned before in Natasha's talk, pure mathematical functions, um, for the same inputs, they always yield the same result or same output. And the key here is they must not have observable side effects. And I italicize this word because it's very important. Lazily computed properties, memory allocation, those sort of things can still be part of a pure algorithm as long as the same inputs lead to the same results, always. So if to an observer the function returns the same thing every time, it doesn't matter if it's calculated lazily, it still has the same inputs to the same outputs. Here are some examples from the standard library that we'll go through real quickly. The string concatenation is a pure algorithm because given two strings, it'll always return the same concatenated string, right? There's nothing surprising about that. Um, generator type, as you iterate through the generator, it's actually mutating in place, like you kind of exhaust the, the collection that you're going through. Um, and this last example is maybe a bit ambiguous, and I wanna talk about this one because I think it's relevant. Um, in my opinion, this property, array.count, is pure because it depends only on the input that is the array itself. If the array hasn't changed, the output, the count, hasn't changed either. So to me, this is, this is a pure function with a hidden input of self. And as long as self doesn't change, the count doesn't change. Just like state and variables and so forth, impure functions are surprising because it becomes extremely difficult to reason about behavior when a function does different things every time it's called. This, I actually couldn't find an attribution for this quote, but it's very true. Um, and just, again, going back to Brian's talk, pure functions are easier to test, pure algorithms are easy to test because you're transforming input to output, and all you need to do is make sure that given a set of inputs, you get the same set of outputs that you expected. Now, like I alluded to before, it's not possible to eliminate all the state from a Cocoa application. Value types and pure algorithms will get you pretty far, but there needs to be some remainder that will be stateful in typical development. Um, but we can isolate it or encapsulate it to reduce its impact on the rest of the program. The single responsibility principle is a good rule of thumb here. Each object should only be in charge of one piece of state, and you should avoid combining the responsibilities for a bunch of different states into one class. Um, as an example of a violation, view controllers often end up managing a lot of different responsibilities when really these could be split out into different objects. And I'll show an example like that in a little bit. Um, 
he is just encapsulating different concepts away from each other because complexity is the mixing together of different concepts. So here's a view controller. It's complexing or combining the concern of logging in with the concern of knowing who's been logged in. And as the implementation grows to manage both of these concerns, it becomes difficult to reason about them separately. You can think about, for example, an instance method on this class. How do you know which methods use which of these properties? They're not really related, but a method might access both or all of them, and it's really hard to tell just from the definition. So suddenly all these things have gotten combined and entwined that don't need to be. But by splitting these concerns into two separate objects, the different pieces of state, the username and password, and whether the user is logged in, uh, don't interact with each other. And the relationships between them are now very explicit, right? You, when you have a username and password, you can log in, and then you get the thing that tells you whether you have a user. This is a simplified example of kind of a larger concept known as stateless core, stateful shell. Um, Gary Bernhardt did a talk about this. Um, but the idea is basically you keep your core logic, your core domain or business logic in value types and in pure algorithms as much as possible. And then once you get to the point where you need some state, like you need to interact with your GUI or you need to write preferences or whatever, you wrap it around the immutable stuff. Um, so your stateful shell can transform the values that are immutable and update the stateful references to them. You have the shell around the immutable stuff in the middle. Um, I think model view, view model, or MVVM is a great example of this stateless core design. Um, and if you haven't heard about it, I'll go through a really brief explanation. But basically, MVVM, which is on the bottom, involves replacing the omniscient view controller of MVC with a less ambitious view model object. The view model, in this case, is owned by the view and it behaves like an adapter of the model. Um, and since the view model is directly responsible for changing the model, and the view is not, and there's no view controller to muddle everything together, um, the model can be immutable, and the view model can just apply transformations to it um, to get a new model out. So let's do a look at a real small example. We have the same user view model from before, and our user struct is the stateless core. It's the immutable bit. Um, and although it is a struct, the view model can still update its user property by transforming the struct and then keeping the new version. So any consumers that have read the logged in user property before the, me the logout method is called, they'll still have a valid user. You haven't messed with anything at a distance, right? Um, but you retain the ability to kind of expose this stateful interface for your GUI programming. But the key is it avoids scary action at a distance. Pulling out a user, you're not affected by anyone else that modifies that property later. So this is the most egregious example of all state, obviously. We all hate globals, right? Um, they're more dangerous because they get mixed in with every single part of your program. If you have a global variable, suddenly it's used everywhere and you don't know how to extract the different uses of it. Um, the dependencies are all implicit and all of your components have gotten coupled together, perhaps without you knowing. If isolation reduces complexity, globals compound it because it's the exact opposite of isolation. Instead of isolating the state, it blankets everything in your application with it. Now, here's really what I wanted to point out. Singletons are just global variables. Um, they suffer from all the problems I was just talking about, and we've just now combined all those problems into one magical object that is very problematic. So, it's really easy to get around this. Instead of you having a singleton that anything can access at any time, just create instances that have the specific functionality that you need and pass those around instead. And I'm gonna pick on a very specific example that shows up in almost every single iOS application, which is networking. Um, so typical API cl client class, right? You have a singleton. This is the Swift singleton pattern, unfortunately. Um, and any time a view controller needs to make a network request, it would probably grab the global variable, the singleton, and do some stuff with it, right? Uh, but this is problematic because now you don't know where this API client is being used, and because of its, the breadth and the depth that it's embedded in your program, you can't update it without knowing all the different places that it'll break, and it becomes hard to test everything because they're all using this global singleton. It's really easy to change, so let's do that. Just remove the singleton accessor and force consumers to instantiate the client before they can use it. And they might instantiate it with a token or whatever it may be. 
Now, whoever creates the view controller that is hypothetically using this client needs to give it the API client that it should be using. It looks a little denser, but the benefits are enormous. These are some of them. It's definitely way, more, way easier to test. Singletons are incredibly difficult to test and usually involve some arcane combination of mocks and stubs. Um, but with an instance, all you need to do is really create a protocol, create a test client that implements that protocol, and then give your view controller that test client instead of the real one. You don't have to mock anything. You don't have to stub anything. Um, and the fact that the view controller depends on the API client is now made explicit in the interface. You've documented that this is a requirement, that this view controller needs access to the API. This helps readers of your code understand the intention and the responsibilities that the view controller has. And the API client has become more flexible. Like if you need to support multiple logins, which is a real example that has happened to me several times in the past, uh, you can create separate instances of your API client, one per user, and suddenly, boom, multiple logins. With a singleton, you would have to refactor everything because the assumption that you made when you created it, that there would only ever be one, no longer holds true. So we looked at how value types and pure algorithms can avoid state and how isolation can reduce the impact of it. Keeping these principles in mind will help you minimize the complexity of your programs and make it easier to adopt the great functional programming practices that I hope you learn about today. Um, but if I had to leave you with just one thing, Minimize your use of state, and you'll have minimized the complexity of your program. Less complexity means more reliable, more maintainable code, and a more pleasant development experience overall. Um, if you're interested in learning more outside of the conference you're already attending, um, here are some resources I'd recommend. Uh, this talk by Andy and Colin Barrett covers, covers a lot of similar things. Um, they talk a lot about determining where truth resides in your program uh, as a strategy for reducing complexity, and I highly recommend watching that. And shameless plug, uh, Reactive Coco, which Josh and I are both authors, uh, offers further mechanisms for minimizing state and complexity. This would take a presentation of its own, but the basic idea is that you think of state as changes over time instead of in-place updates, which makes it really easier to understand and manipulate changes in general. Or just try your hand at a purely functional programming language, because this will really twist your mind. Working in a language like Haskell or Elm will open your eyes to just how unnecessary a state really is. And even if you never use them in a real application, uh, they'll like, teach you valuable lessons that you can take back and apply to everyday programming, just like Brian alluded to. So thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. So you all, whenever you talk about state, you always talk about it in a mutable sense, and then values as immutable. But does it mean something to you if there's an immutable state? Does that mean the same thing as a value, or does that not, like that's not? Uh, so I mean, based on the definition that I was using, which is like state is the sum of a bunch of values at a point in time, to me state implies mutability, because over time, that collection is changing. Um, a value to me is timeless. It's an immutable atom that will always exist, whether it's the past, present, or future. Um, and this is one of the things that Rich Hickey alluded to in his simple made easy talk. And so I've kind of gone with that definition. But ultimately, I guess it just depends on agreeing on definitions before you start talking about something. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Um, what do you think about um, just uh, our, what do you think about uh, creating like a stateless uh, like sort of like machine out of something that is inherently stateful like talking to graphics. Is that even like a tenable like mission? So, like, it, it, is that even possible? Are you talking about like React or uh, the, I'm, the I'm Facebook? I'm talking about um, the pure gra like gra open GL metal that sort. Do you think it's even possible to create a, state like a stateless mechanism out of that? Sure. I do think it is possible, and similar things have been done for UIKit and, and for JavaScript HTML DOM. Um, and the basic idea is you create something that represents an immutable list of instructions to be performed on a stateful thing at a later point in time. Um, and so it's like in, in the case of OpenGL, you don't ever mutate the state machine directly while you're building this stuff up. You just capture a bunch of instructions for how to mutate the state machine, and then later on that happens. So. You haven't gotten rid of state necessarily, but you've encapsulated it away into this component that hides that for you. <laughs>
uh, yeah. I haven't checked in in a little while, so uh, pardon if this is out of date. Uh, but okay. what's the state of reactive Coco 3.0? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is really hard to come up with a good API uh, that won't need to change in the future. And that's why it's taken so long, because I don't want to break clients more than we have to. Um, and the other part of that difficulty has been we didn't have a real world test bed for it, because we can't just go and refactor all of GitHub for Mac tomorrow and suddenly have a production app using it. Um, but now that Carthage is out, that is one big consumer of Reactive Cocoa's Swift API, so that'll help a lot. Um, and I think we'll see more progress toward that goal. But I can't give you a date. Yeah. Uh, is Swift structs are passed by value and classes are passed by uh, reference. So you're saying to use the immutable data structures, you should use structs for this. Is there any particular benefit other than forcing to be immutable and passed by value? And is there any drawback of using structs for your data structures? Um, I mean, I'm a big proponent of using structs over classes whenever possible. So as long as your API permits it, I would always recommend that. Um, one concrete example of where it might be useful is like if you think about Swift's array struct, it has an append method, and that appears to be mutating. Um, but because it's a struct, you still have an immutable thing, but you get the convenience of a mutable API on top of it. And so it's like you don't need to convert back between NS array and NS mutable array. It just depends on whether you have it in a var or let variable, right? Um, I mean, there's the drawbacks, I guess, would be the functionality you lose by not having classes, but ultimately, I would argue that those aren't good features anyways. Yep. Uh, sorry, there are lots of hands. Tom? Oh, um, so you talked about how mutating methods and setters on a value type are really just an alternate syntax to writing a function that takes value and returns it to value. Yep. Uh, have you discovered downsides to using that syntax? To using the mutal, mutating syntax? Yeah, like the fact your ability to like compose uh, mutations. Yeah, definitely. Like you can't you can't string those together like you can reduce and map and so forth. But um, I don't know. It, it's more accessible, I guess. So you can offer both. But my my key point was just that if you put a var inside of a struct, that's not inherently a bad thing because you still have an immutable struct. Yeah. Oh, oh. sorry. Uh, yeah, in the back. Um, when you do the model view on top of an immutable model, how do you handle coordination between multiple model views that point to the same underlying model object when a change happens on one of the model views? Sure. I, I'm really sorry. I haven't been repeating questions until this point. I just remembered. Um, so the question was, how do you coordinate between multiple view models when you have one model that undergoes change? Is that correct? Um, so like, if you're using the example of core data, Typically, the way I would describe it is you have one source of truth. And in core data, that might be the database, for example. Um, and those view models, if they're using that one source of truth, the source of truth itself should be synchronized and present kind of this consistent interface. Um, but if you really need to coordinate between different view models, we usually do that with hierarchy. So you might have a parent view model that represents the whole screen, and then sub view models that represent parts of the screen, and they can delegate upward if they really need to coordinate amongst each other. So you would like push new instances of the model back into the other view models or something? I'm saying like a follower count gets updated. You have multiple things displaying follower count. Like if you're not changing the follower count in the underlying model object, how do the other things know to update that? That's kind of a complicated question in its own right. Um, the key is that like just what I was talking about in the talk, you want to avoid having multiple sources of state. You want to avoid having caches, things that alias each other. Um, so there should only be one source of follower count that is being updated and read from, and ultimately everything else should be derived from that. And how to do that is uh, more time than I have to go into, but <laughs> that's the general idea. I'm sorry, we're out of time for questions, but grab me afterward and I'll be happy to answer.